1895, the American section of the Theosophical Society, under the leadership of William Quan Judge, declared itself an autonomous body. Within a year, the judge would die, and Catherine Tingley, a relatively unknown member of the society, would assume control. A member from the New York uh, from the New York branch named Clement Griscom and others soon grew suspicious of Tingley's doctrinal innovations. At the Theosophical Convention of 1898, Tingley folded the Theosophical Society into her umbrella organization known as the Universal Brotherhood. The legality of the proceeding was called into question by the Griscom-led the uh, Theosophists who declared themselves the legitimate successors of William Quan Judge, and therefore the original society. It took some time for the small Briscoe PS to find its footing, and from 1898 until 1903, their journal, the Theosophical Forum, was the only corporate activity of the group. In time, they regained organizational stability, and in 1903, Briscoe established the Theosophical Quarterly, Raising the public theosophical meetings. By 1906, they were an international federation of lodges governed by an executive committee. Okay. Like other theosophical organizations, the Griscom TS had an esoteric section. Theirs would come to be known as the Order of the Living Christ. In the 1950s, this group would be responsible for creating the religious studies think tank at Harvard, known as the Center for the Study of World Religions. So while working on a project documenting the history of the center, I came across a copy of Talks on Religion by Henry Bettinger Mitchell, one of the members of the Order of the Living Christ. <laughs> the copy of this book in Harvard Library was unique in that some previous owner had made notations indicating the identity of the anonymous participants and the discussions recorded in the book. I looked for evidence within the text and cross-referenced it with other works to verify that these identities <coughs> were indeed correct. So going down the list in order in which they appear, I will try to show evidence in support of the notations and hopefully restore these anonymous names. Henry Benjamin Mitchell was born in Babylon, New York in 1874 and received his early education in Manhattan's Berkeley School. He entered Columbia College in the class of 1895 where he developed a reputation for his mathematical talent. His interest in theosophy seems to have developed through his contact with Clement and Genevieve Briscoe, his neighbors in Flushing, Queens, who introduced him to William Kwan Judge, the president of the Theosophical Society in America. Just before the end of his freshman year at Columbia, Mitchell transferred to the Dresden Polytechnical School in Germany, but returned to Columbia the following year, whereupon he entered the Columbia School of Mines. He remained there for two years, but he again withdrew, and this time for mercantile pursuits. This coincides with the 1898 uh, Theosophical Convention, where it was rumored that Mitchell was elected by occult forces to be the leader of the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society. This Mitchell would deny, stating, quote, why I am not even an adept in theosophy, let alone being possessed by of this alleged influence. Mitchell once again returned to Columbia, and in June 1898, he received a degree in electrical engineering. And he remained at Columbia, where he ultimately received a degree in the Masters of the Arts and Mathematics in 1900. His thesis, titled Transcendental Numbers, their existence and certain of their properties with introductory chapter on certain theorems regarding infinite assemblages was a combination of his mystical and mathematical interests. That same year, he began teaching at Columbia as a tutor in the Faculty of Mathematics. By 1903, Mitchell was president of the New York branch of the Griscom Theosophical Society and living at the Benedict at 80 Washington Square East. A bachelor apartment named after the bachelor and much ado about nothing the apartments were especially popular with writers, architects, and brokers who made up most of the tenants. In 1905, Mitchell became an adjunct professor, his first year acting under the direction of Columbia's president, 
Nicholas Murray Butler, Mitchell had the unenviable task of overseeing a committee which briefly abolished football at the university. <laughs> his popularity with students, however, remained untarnished, and his relationship with his colleagues at Columbia were likewise warm, and having friends among many departments. In addition to being uh, the, uh, the president of the New York branch, Mitchell would publish several articles in Theosophical Forum and its successor, the Theosophical Quarterly. And one of these contributions, an essay titled Meditation, was a treatise on the Theosophical method of meditation as a means of interfacing with the Oversoul or one's own divine nature. In 1906, Meditation was published as a monograph. In the summer of 1906, Mitchell prepared a set of articles for the Quarterly called Talks of Religion. And this series would be a candid discussion regarding the religious landscape of the time as seen and interpreted through the lens of his colleagues at Columbia University. Right. Yeah, there we go. So next up is the historian, James Harvey Robinson. James Harvey Robinson was born in 1863 in Bloomington, Illinois, and began his teaching career at the University of Pennsylvania in 1891. In 1895, he accepted a position at Columbia College where he introduced the study of intellectual history and wrote popular textbooks for high school and college. In 1920, uh, 1912, Robinson published one of his most influential works, The New History, in which he asked scholars to address their work to general audiences and for history teachers to select those aspects of the past that had a significance on the present. This idea is present in the talk uh, from the historian who states, I wish that we could wipe out all the secondhand opinions of history, all the overgrowth of, yeah, overgrowth of tradition and prejudice and force the world back, uh, in each case, to its original records. Uh, in 1919, in response to disputes over academic freedom, Robinson would resign from Columbia, and he would later help establish the New School for Social Research with John Dewey and serve as the first director of the institution. Frederick James Eugene Woodbridge, the philosopher. Born in Windsor, uh, he was born in Windsor, Ontario in 1867, and was an Aristotelian scholar and a member of the Realist School of Philosophy. After completing his education at the University of Berlin, Woodbridge returned to the United States in 1894, where he taught philosophy at the University of Minnesota. In 1902, he accepted a teaching position at Columbia University as the first Johnsonian professor of philosophy. Woodbridge's connection with Mitchell and the Theosophical Society can be traced back to at least 1903 when he delivered a lecture titled The Appeal of Idealism for their winter program. The following year, in 1904, Woodbridge co-founded the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods at Columbia. Uh, the publication was envisioned as a realist alternative to Cornell University's Philosophical Review, which favored idealism. In 1912, Woodbridge would become Columbia's Dean of Faculty of Political Science, Philosophy, and Pure Science. And in this capacity, Woodbridge was celebrated for helping Columbia emerge as, quote, a world-class university. He would retire in 1937, but continue to edit the Journal of Philosophy until his death in 1941. Uh, the zoologist Henry Edward Crampton. Uh, Crampton was a curator of the invertebrate zoology at New York's American Museum of Natural History, as well as the professor of zoology at Columbia University from 1904 to 1943. And during the months of February and March 1907, Crampton delivered a series of eight ad uh, addresses at Cooper Union for the Hewitt Lectures of Columbia University. In one of these lectures, Crampton states, sometimes a single tapeworm parasitic in the human body will produce 300 million. We find a similar wording attributed to the zoologist in the talks when he says, consider, for instance, the poor little tapeworm, which has to lay 300 million eggs, that one, one may survive and come to fruition. Crampton, who began researching the variation, geographical distribution, and evolution of Polynesian land snails in 1906, would sail for the Society Islands in the spring of 1907. And references to this uh, expedition are found in chapter eight of the talks in which uh, Mitchell states, the zoologist had sailed from the South Pacific 
seeking further data for its research into the origin and mutation of species. Mm -hmm. This one's an easy one. So Charles Johnson was born in County Down, Ireland in 1867. Uh, and the second, he was the second son of William Johnson, a conservative unionist MP for South Belfast. Studying at Dublin's Erasmus Smith High School in the 1880s, Johnson would meet W.B. Yates. In 1885, Johnson, Yates, and their friends would establish the Dublin Hermetic Society and later the Dublin Theosophical Society. After studying Sanskrit with Robert Atkinson at Trinity College, Dublin, uh, Johnston was admitted into the Bengal Civil Service in 1886. Just before, just before deploying to Bengal in 1888, Johnston married Vera Zelohovsky, the niece of Madame Blavatsky. The Johnstons would live in India for two years, returning to Europe in 1890 after Johnston contracted malaria. Back in England, Johnston would write a celebrated Sanskrit grammar and complete his first major work titled from the Upanishads in 1896. In October 1896, the Johnstons moved to New York with Clement Briscoe doing for much to facilitate their coming. Johnson then taught one of the first nine university affiliated Sanskrit courses in the United States and became a driving force behind the Irish literary, literary revival. In 1905, Johnston joined the faculty of Columbia as a lecturer of history for the extension courses. In addition to contributing numerous articles and essays for the Theosophical Journals, Johnson wrote for popular magazines like The Atlantic, Harper's Weekly, and Cosmopolitan. Using mainstream media to subtly influence public perception of theosophical ideas. In 1899, it was said that, quote, Johnston was doing very good theosophical work through his articles in secular magazines. There was no better way to reach the public and impregnate the thought of the day with theosophical philosophy than to furnish readings which uh, were not labeled theosophy. And we find an example of this in the talks with the author's summary of R.J. Campbell's New Theology, in which he states, the philosophy underlying the new the uh, theology may be called monistic idealism, and monistic idealism recognizes no fundamental distinction between matter and spirit. The fundamental reality is consciousness. The so-called material world is the product of consciousness exercising itself along a certain limited plane. The next stage of consciousness above this is not an absolute break with it, although it is an expansion of experience of readjusting the focus. focus. So this statement is repeated verbatim in Johnson's article, The New Theology in England, in the July 1907 issue of the North American Review. The clergyman, uh, Percy Stickney Grant. Grant was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1860 after graduating from Harvard University in 1883 and Episcopal Theological School in 1886. Grant commenced his ministry in Fall River, Massachusetts, though his ideas about running the church were in opposition to those in the vestry. His commitment to social reform won him praise from church hierarchy, and in 1893, Grant was called to the Church of the Ascension in New York where noted financiers like J.P. Morgan filled the pews. Both Mitchell and Griscom were members of the Vestry for the Ascension. And records indicate that Grant knew the Griscom family since at least 1902, the year in which they moved to the Washington Square, he wrote. There are numerous allusions to the clergy being Grant, but an admission from his friend, Juliet Thompson, indicates that the true identity <coughs> is, in fact, Grant. Editor Clement Acton Griscom Jr. So Clement Acton Griscom Jr. was the son of a shipping magnate, C.A. Griscom Sr., and Francis Canby Biddle, and born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1868. Griscom, who belonged to an old, well established Quaker family, attended the Friends Day School on Race Street and studied business at the University of Pennsylvania. Both his maternal and paternal lines played important roles in Pennsylvania history. His great aunt, Betsy Ross, was credited with designing the American flag. Griscom joined the Theosophical Society in 1887, but out of respect for his father, whose name he shared, he declined to be publicly identified with the society. In 1889, Griscom married Genevieve Square Lovell, who would join him in the Theosophical Society within a year of their wedding. 
And as mentioned before, 1894, tensions escalated between the Theosophical Authorities and Adyar and William Vaughan Judge, the leader of the American section of the society. And over the winter of 1894, Riskin, who was in communication with uh, members of the American section, drafted the initial plans for American secession at his home in Whitestone, Queens. In April 1895, at the Theosophical Convention in Boston, Briscoe, on behalf of the Committee of Resolutions, was the first to declare the autonomy of the American branches under the name the Theosophical Society in America. The biologist, Gary Calkins. Gary Calkins was born in Valparaiso, Indiana in 1869 and received his PhD from Columbia University in 1887. In 1906, the year the talks began, Calkins accepted a position at Columbia University where he remained until retirement uh, in, 18, er, in 1939. Calkins was a pioneer in the study of single cell life forms and greatly expanded our knowledge of several unicellular, unicellular organisms and defined several new species and made many contributions to the taxonomy of amoeba. His research focused primarily on the life cycles of various protozoa, and the result of his research was uh, his first work, the, the Protozoa in 1901, and it was the first English language book on the subject. As a biologist at the New York State Cancer Laboratory, Calkins was, an active, was active in cancer research, and in the beginnings of, of his career, he investigated the role which single cell life forms might play in causing illness in both humans and fish. In February 1907, Calkins made advancements in cancer research, prompting the New York Times to run an article about Calkins titled, The Calls of Cancer Probably Discovered. Clues, to Calkins, clues that Calkins is the biologist can be found in the talks with references uh, to his absence. So during the talk in February, it said that the biologist was presenting a paper before the uh, Society for Experimental Biology uh, on, on a discovery regarding can uh, the cancer germ. And we find that on February 20th, 1907, Calkins presented a paper on this uh, very topic for the Society for Experimental Biology. Um, during the talks in May, it stated that the biologist was presiding at a medical conference in a distant city. And on May 22nd, 1907, Calkins presided at the 23rd meeting of the Society for Experimental Biology. And that's three more minutes left. Okay. I'll run through these then. Social philosopher, William Pepperell Montague. So it is described uh, as a professor of philosophy, much interested in socialism. There's uh, plenty of clues in, in the book for, uh, for this, but probably the most obvious one would be that he lived during the same period of the, of the time frame of the talks at Upton Sinclair's experimental uh, socialist community known as the Helicon Home Colony, uh, who also found support among his colleague, John Dewey. Let's see. The banker, we got J.F.B. Mitchell. So born in 1878, uh, J.F.B. was an alumnus of Columbia College like his brother, Henry Bedford Mitchell. And upon graduating in, uh, graduating in 1898, uh, he promptly enlisted in the U.S. Army as, a Span as the Spanish-American War had just commenced. Uh, after leaving the Army, he would, in 1901, he would work for the banking firm Redmond Kerr and Company. Okay, we got John Dewey. Blair, um, I'm passing by this point. Okay, the privatist philosopher John Dewey, referred to by some as the father of modern education. Um, was born in 1859. In 1905, following the publication of Studies in Logical Theory, Dewey joined the philosophical or philosophy department at Columbia University, where he would, he would teach until his retirement in 1930. Um, yeah, going through the text in here, you can see that much of what is attributed to the pragmatist in this uh, in talks on religion are, are, are very analogous to his 1908 work, Ethics. We got the anthropologist, Livingston Ferrand. Uh, in 1891, Ferrand received his PhD from Columbia College. In 1893, while an adjunct professor of psychology at Columbia, 
Ferran joined Ferran's Boas on several expeditions to the Pacific Northwest, which resulted in Ferran becoming a full professor of anthropology at Columbia in 1903. 1904 saw the release of his work, uh, The Basis of American History, uh, and the language which Ferran uses in that work to describe Native American spirituality is reminiscent of the words attributed to the anthropologist in the talks, especially passages regarding Manatu. Uh, from 1914 to 1919, Ferran served as president of the University of Colorado, and in 1921, he became the fourth president of Cornell University. Oxonian, Dickinson S. Miller. Uh, Miller was born in Philadelphia in 1868 and was a professor of philosophy, quote, much interested in psychology and an earnest churchman. Uh, there's, there's several, uh, again, another more evidence to suggest that, that, that Miller is a Oxonian, but again, we have Juliet Thompson saying flat out that. It was through Professor Mitchell that Dickinson Miller was brought to Percy Grant Church. So that show your time that's one of uh, Okay. Let me just do this last one. I'll skip over uh, Brown, but here we have the youth. Uh, is Max Eastman. And again, we have by his own admission and a passage in the text referencing Dickinson S. Miller. And this this, this uh, reference to canoeing from the Hudson. So that's it. That's that's the participants of the talk. <laughs> <laughs>